Hello everybody, thank you for watching my video today and in today's video we're going to be looking at the high yield vomiting child for finals. So just a little bit of information about the medicine guide is that it's a YouTube channel dedicated to supporting medical students throughout their entire time and journey at medical school. So I've got a series dedicated to being successful at medical school, so it includes videos like how to be successful in the pre-clinical years, how to be successful during the clinical years, how to get the most out of GP placements, how to get the most out of hospital placements, and how to be successful in the clinical OSCEs. Also, I've got a paediatrics specials edition dedicated to the high yield pathologies that crop up in medical school final exams, such as high yield congenital heart disease, high yield child with a mass, high yield limping child, high yield genetic conditions, and high yield paediatric rashes. So if you haven't watched any of those videos, please do check them out. If you enjoy my video today, if you've enjoyed my previous videos, then please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe and support my YouTube channel by subscribing, please. Please also share this video with your friends and please post in the comment section below what you think of this video. So without much further ado, let's get started. So the outline of today's video is that I'm going to discuss the key high yield causes of vomiting in paediatrics, which crop up in medical school examinations. So I'm going to be focusing on gourd, duodenal atresia, Hirschsprung disease and gastroenteritis. Also, necrotizing enterocolitis, acute appendicitis and pyloric stenosis are high yield pathologies, which also lead to vomiting in children. Now, I've previously covered them in my video, detailed high yield child with a mass for finals. So please have a look at that video if you want to find out about those particular diseases. But in today's video, I'm just going to focus on the previous four that I mentioned. OK, so let's get started. So gourd crops up practically in every single exam. So gourd is when there is an inappropriate relaxation of a weakened lower esophageal sphincter. So this leads to reflux of gastric acid and any food content. So there are two types of hernias which can contribute towards gourd. So you can have a sliding hiatal hernia. So that's when usually the fundus or a potentially small portion of the cardia is pushed through the esophageal sphincter and it's herniating above the diaphragm. There's also a parasophageal rolling hiatal hernia where you've got the fundus as well as the cardia which is pushed through the esophageal sphincter. Okay and these two can contribute towards gourd. So in gourd a child will vomit following a feed. Now this vomiting will be a non-bilious vomiting. That's key. That's something that you really, really need to be aware of. The child will have unexplained feeding difficulties and faltering growth. Now unexplained feeding difficulties sounds quite vague, but what the child will be experiencing is that the child will be refusing to feed, they'll be gagging or choking after the feeds. Okay, so in terms of tests, so gourd is a clinical diagnosis, but you can do a 24 hour pH monitoring to help support this diagnosis. And in terms of management, we can offer children initially Gaviscon and then give them a trial of omeprazole or ranitidine. So omeprazole is an example of a proton pump inhibitor and ranitidine is an example of a H2 receptor antagonist. Now the definitive treatment, the surgical management of gourd is nissels fundoplication. So if you look at the far right, so that's when you have a fundus being wrapped around the, the cardia of the stomach and then sutured over. So that helps to support the cardia and it stops it from herniating through and stops the sliding hiatal hernia or the parasophageal rolling hiatal hernia from developing. And you need to be aware of the surgical management of gourd, which is nissels from duplication, because it crops up time and time again in final exams. Okay. 
Okay, so now we're going to look at duodenal atresia. So in duodenal atresia, this is when we've either got a narrowing of the duodenum or we've got some degree of obstruction in the duodenum. So the major risk factor for duodenal atresia is Down syndrome. So please remember that duodenal atresia begins with a D, as does Down syndrome, and hopefully that association will, will help you to remember that patients with Down syndrome are at high risk of developing a duodenal atresia. So they present with bilious vomiting in the first few days of life. An abdominal x-ray is key in the diagnosis of duodenal atresia, which will have a double bubble. So if you look in the far right hand side, you can see that the gastric bubble is identified and this is identified with the letter S to stand for stomach. So you've got the stomach bubble, the gastric bubble, and you've also got this duodenal bubble. So in terms of management, we offer patients IV fluids because obviously they'll be dehydrated and NG tube decompression. And the ultimate management or the definitive management of duodenal atresia is that we need to perform a surgical intervention known as a duodenostomy. Apologies for the pronunciation. <laughs> and now I'm going to look at Hirschsprung disease. So Hirschsprung disease is when you've got failure of the myenteric and the aeobac plexus is developing in a bowel segment. So there's abnormal development of the parasympathetic innervation to the distal bowel. So the major risk factor for Hirschsprung disease is Down syndrome. And the key signs is that the child will have delayed passage of the meconium. So meconium is the first stool that a newborn will expel. Now, if you've got delayed passage of meconium, so the meconium hasn't presented for at least 48 hours after the initial birth, that's a red flag symptom. The child will also experience bilis vomiting, they'll be unable to pass flatus per rectus, and they'll also have very loose stools. So in terms of tests, a rectal or punch biopsy is a gold standard. Now that biopsy will identify that there's a lack of ganglionic cells, and also after this biopsy, explosive diarrhea will be experienced afterwards by the child. Now in terms of management, you really do need to know this, it's important. Initially, you perform a rectal washout or bowel irrigation, and then afterwards you do an anorectal pull through. So it's important that you're aware of what order the management is, because that's something that can crop up quite easily in an exam. So please remember that initially you do a rectal washout or bowel irrigation, and then you perform an anorectal pull through. So now we're going to focus on gastroenteritis. So there are lots of different infections which can lead to gastroenteritis. And this is something that you need to be aware of for your exams because this is quite a high yield topic. So they might give a description of some of the symptoms in the SBA and you'll have to discover and identify what the underlying organism is. So we'll start through the top and we'll work our way to the bottom and we'll go through this at a nice easy pace. So E. coli is commonly known as traveller's diarrhoea. So it typically occurs in travellers and they present with a watery diarrhoea. They experience abdominal cramps and nausea. Giardiasis presents with a prolonged non bloody diarrhea. Cholera presents with a profuse watery diarrhea. Eventually patients suffer from dehydration and then this leads to weight loss. Shigella leads to bloody diarrhea, vomiting and abdominal pain. Staphylococcus aureus leads to severe vomiting and campylobacter will lead to flu-like symptoms and then crampy abdominal pain, fever and bloody diarrhea and it can mimic appendicitis. Now campylobacter can also lead to Julian Barry syndrome and that's a neurological condition and that's something that I hope to make a video about in a few weeks time. 
so please keep an eye out for that. Bacillus cereus will lead to vomiting within six hours after eating rice, traditionally, or diarrhea after six hours. So if there is an exam question where you have to identify an, an organism that leads to gastroenteritis and it has the shortest incubation time, then Bacillus cereus is the organism that comes to mind. And then amoebus will lead to gradual bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain and tenderness that lasts for several weeks. So this is the end of my video now, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you for staying with me throughout this entire video. And I just wanted to please ask you to give me a thumbs up for this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, share my video with your friends and post in the comment section below. So again, thank you for watching and I wish you all the best with your exams.